Hello, everyone, and welcome to Church Online. Today, we are talking about love. That is the pink candle on the Advent wreath, if you're looking at that or you see it. Um, anyway, so that's what we're, we're talking about today. And so the uh, passage that go, that we're reading with uh, that today, with uh, Advent in mind, is uh, 1 John 4.10. It says, This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And, and maybe you're wondering, what is Advent? As we've discussed before, Advent is a season dedicated to the anticipation of the arrival, or Advent, of Messiah King Jesus. And so when uh, Jesus came, obviously they were looking forward to that. So traditionally Advent is celebrated as looking forward to the arrival, the birth of Jesus. However, as Christians, we need to approach this differently. So we look back to look forward. We know that he came once. And so we're looking forward to, we are, we are, uh, looking to the advent, the arrival of his second coming. And so that's how we need to position it. So our lives, we need to make sure that we're aligned to that. And so we're going through uh, hope, joy, peace, love, and his birth with that all in mind. That's how we're thinking of it today. And so, um, again, we got love. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So what kind of love are we talking about today? Well, the 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 biblical the biblical word, the Greek word uh, that we're looking at in the different passages that we come across today, it's agape. And what does agape mean? Basically, it's that love that is that unreserved, unconditional, fully poured out desire for at the betterment of the receiver of the affection. Okay, so just understanding that agape, it's unconditional love in an, in a nutshell. Okay, so as we as we go through today, this is going to be kind of how we frame our understanding. And so at Christmas time, uh, oftentimes one of the things that we'll hear people uh, talk about is keeping Christ in Christmas, right? You'll see the bumper stickers, magnets, wall signs, decals that say "Keep Christ in Christmas." And so what I think people mean by that is, okay, so this is my understanding, I'm going to assume the best about people, is that there's a propensity in our culture to despiritualize this time of year, this season, this holiday, to make it generic and, and to, to water it down. And so the heart behind the statement is to keep Christ at the center, to keep him as the focus. And so the... Um, uh, being completely honest, I think that the church in its desire to do this has actually failed spectacularly for some time even. So as we discuss, uh, they've, or as we will discuss, I think the church has made it about the wrong things. Okay. And you're like, well, how can you make it not about Jesus? That's obviously the point. That's the heart. I think that's the statement. I think that's the heart, but what ends up happening is something different. You see, the, the world, it fails at celebrating Christmas because it makes the, the point of Christmas about the holidays. There's fairy tales about bearded men with reindeer or snowmen. The, the world says things like, happy holidays. Uh, they invite you to buy a holiday tree and to watch a holiday classic movie and TV show, and they make it about presents and arguing with family. Then there's the church, and the church fails because we emphasize historically inaccurate things, which are basically fairy tales, like how the angels looked, when, where Jesus was born. We, um, we care about how things are spelled and think that there's something specifically Christian about the word Christmas and have made it uh, some sacred thing uh, in, regarding the holiday, while we secretly... We want to make it about getting some necessary rest and about presence and arguing with family. So people who claim the title of Christ have said they want to keep Christ in Christmas. And yet, I think by their actions and their focus, they actually don't want that. At least in, like, that's not what's coming out. That's not what's being emphasized. So what they want is the name Christmas with all the other goodies. So what does the Bible say about Christmas? I mean, 
if it's so significant, our faith must address this past, address Christmas. And, and not only that, it, just, it should dwell on it. It should give it emphasis. So making sure that we understand how important is this, how vital is Christmas to Scripture? How much does it matter? So honestly, right, obviously the side's already up there. Christmas isn't mentioned even once in Scripture. Okay, so maybe for you that's a shock. It's not mentioned once. Zero times is it addressed. In fact, Scripture doesn't even spend all that much time talking about Jesus' birth. You get some prophecies in the, right in the Old Testament looking to how he's going to come, why he's going to come, what's the purpose, all of that. But you don't get into the nitty-gritty. And when you do see the nitty-gritty, there's only a handful of chapters that are dedicated to it, and that's between two Gospels, Matthew and Luke. John, he doesn't spend any time there, other than addressing maybe like the theological understanding of what took place in the birth. And then you have um, uh, Mark, who doesn't go there at all. Arguably, the book of Revelation does talk about it, but again, it does it in a cosmic sense, not in the way that we're traditionally kind of looking at it when we consider Christmas. And it's more of a picture, it's more of a prophetic language, right? You're seeing the the dragon and all of that. So we talked about that last Christmas. So if you want to understand what we're talking about there, go for that uh, message and feel free to look it up. And so what we need to do is take a step back and understand that there's some things about Christmas that we need to understand. First off, is it important that God showed up? Yes, obviously it is important. But it's interesting, again, how Scripture only takes a few moments to acknowledge that it even happened. But where's the emphasis? On his death and resurrection. And then Scripture turns to what we should be ready for, his return. The Gospel writers themselves thought that the only thing that really mattered in the grand scheme of things to document was the last three years of his life, and they all spend a lot of the time on the last couple weeks of his life. So when we understand what does God actually care about, yes, God cares that he showed up. Obviously, he did it intentionally. But where does he want our minds to go? What should we have as our focus? What should we have as our heart, as our guiding principle throughout all of this? Well, it's um, his, his mission and his accomplishment. And so we see in uh, 1 John chapter 4, uh, again, that we, we looked at this passage. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So the emphasis, again, is not that he came and there's a reason for this. And I think it's best explained this way. So historically, there's a bunch of myths and legends about gods and uh, or a god coming down and uh, doing crazy things through or to people. But then there's Jesus and Jesus is different. He loved the world. Why? Because he made it. He cared deeply for it. And even after humanity rejected him, he still loved them and established from recorded history his plan. He wanted to redeem them. He set the stage by being the one to cover their nakedness. Uh, talking about Adam and Eve. You see, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Why did he do that? So that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And it's not that God showed up. It's what he accomplished when he showed up that makes everything different and significant and important. Many people and this very much includes Christians, have no real understanding of the origins of Christmas. They think they know, right? And they have all these convoluted ideas of pagan stories and whatever else. But there's a lot more to it. Much of what we celebrate and consider to be keeping uh, Christ in Christmas is actually only 200 to 500 years old in terms of celebrations. So it's not even something that goes back a thousand years or 2000 years to right after when Jesus was here. What the church has done in a few instances is added biblical value. They've redeemed cultural things about Christmas or things that were used 
like what we've been talking about with the Advent wreath, right? So you've, uh, if you've been in a church service here, Laura has been up at the front, uh, one of our board members, and she has talked about the Christmas wreath. What does it uh, sign? Uh, what's the significance of the different portions? The green of it is life, and uh, the circle is unending life. The the red berries they they, they represent his blood. Now, is that necessarily? True? No, but what we've done is we've redeemed these different things and we've added the value to it. We've added the spiritual value. So we've redeemed elements and tied them to God's. And there's nothing wrong with this. And in fact, the Apostle Paul, he did this in Acts. Okay, so he, there's the altar to the unknown God. Paul then stood up in the meeting of Agrippus and said, People of, the Ath of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. And so he used that altar to explain to them who God was. So we took something in that culture that was actually used for demonic means, worshiping something that wasn't God, and turned it to God, put the emphasis on him. So there's nothing wrong with doing that, right? It's not biblical. It's not, I mean, in the sense that like when we look at the wreath, like it's not in the Bible, but what we've done is we've redeemed it. We've added significance. We've added value to it, right? So since some things in our tradition, we don't have answers for. And so the question is, again, can we redeem things? Absolutely. And again, we do this all of the time. So at Easter, what day of the week do we celebrate Jesus' death? We do it on Friday. What day of the week do we celebrate the resurrection? We celebrate it on Sunday. So if you didn't know, the days of the week are named after different gods, Greek and Roman. We don't care about that. Now it's just a day. That's just the way we refer to it. And we say Sunday is one of the greatest days. And it's not because of the name. It's because of what happened. So we've done it with that. right? And, and so um, when they chose to celebrate Christmas, historically, the birth of Jesus, they did it around 200 years after Jesus' death. And they chose that date for a few reasons. It wasn't to hijack some pagan holiday. okay? That came after. So, so that's just, again, people misusing history and reapplying it. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this now. But what's most interesting is when they chose to celebrate the day of Christ's arrival, they called it Christmas, meaning Christ being sent, his sending. They celebrated the mission of Christ, which was to seek and to save the lost. They didn't emphasize his birth necessarily. It was about why he came. That was the emphasis. Okay, so for us, though, like, so we, and we ask the question, what about some other practical things? Like, so Christmas trees, they're not unbiblical. They're just not biblical, right? They're, they're, they're just a thing. So you can add spiritual value to it, but it's just a thing. There's nothing biblical or Christ-centered about the Christmas tree you can put Jesus onto it and kind of a thing and, and, and add value that way. But in and of itself, it's a tree with lights and some hangy balls. That's all it is. December 25th, it's just a date. We can add spiritual value to it, but it is just a day. Just like the church, it is just a building. Okay, right? There's the church. Obviously, that's us. But when we talk about the church, we talk about the building, right? We add value to it. We add spiritual value to it. It is just brick and mortar and some wood. That's all it is. And all of this is why I say as we celebrate Advent, we're looking forward. So yes, Jesus came and he did so in spectacular fashion. But now we look forward to what he's going to do next. We're looking forward to his return because that's the emphasis we find in Scripture. Now, as a side note, I'm going to walk you guys through a little bit of something that happened in the last little bit here at the church. And this isn't an attack on anyone. I just want to equip you guys to know the truth. Okay, because this has been something that's come up a few times in my life as I've been in the church. And uh, not, not necessarily here, but in other churches. And I just want to put this to rest because it's just getting annoying, to be truthful. Um, 
some people didn't like that I put the word Xmas on the church sign because they think that it's taking Christ out of Christmas or whatever reason, other reason they may have. However, there's several reasons why this is actually a non-issue. The first one is the word Christos is in Greek looks like that on the screen there. Okay, so that is the Greek version of Christ. Xmas. Okay, you're seeing it. Mass meaning in Latin, it means sent. So you got the Greek and the Latin coming together to make Xmas. It's biblical. There's historical precedent for this. This abbreviation of Xmas, okay, as we basically functionally use it today, has been an abbreviation that has been used for about at least, if not longer than 1500 years. So linguistically and historically, I have the backing to put Xmas on the church sign. Second, it saves space and it's a common abbreviation that everyone knows what we're talking about. And it's a li linguistic tradition, or the reason why is because it's a linguistic tradition that goes back over 1500 years. So if you've ever been told that writing Xmas takes Christ out of Christmas, you were actually told something wrong. Okay, they were wrong, whoever told you that historically and linguistically, it's just bad teaching, right? You don't have to like the abbreviation, I don't care. You don't have to use it, but... It's not taking Christ out of Christmas to put Xmas. And maybe you're thinking, wow, this is really silly. Why are you talking about this? Because this is why we're talking about it. People have been talking about taking Christ out of Christmas. And yet what they've been doing is they've been attacking something that's not actually taking Christ out of Christmas. Their focus has been trying to keep Jesus in there. Well, really, they're just attacking him. So we need to understand that. And so when we get upset about a Christmas tree getting called a holiday tree and we put our foot down and start making a big deal about that, that I could argue is definitely taking Christ out of Christmas because you're emphasizing the wrong tree. Not just the wrong word, the wrong tree. There's a tree that we should be looking at and it's the one where Jesus died where the greatest miracle took place upon it. So God showing up is one thing. What he accomplished, that's the greater thing. So again, the scriptural emphasis is this. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't God demonstrated his love for us and he came as a baby. It's that he died for us. You see, God loves us. That's the emphasis. It's not on the words. It's not on whether or about something was appropriate and, re and reused. It's not about the presence and making sure you have the manger scene. It's about Christ's mission. So scripture is a collection of documents that we pull together and call the Bible, God's documented word for us. And he emphasizes in that his mission, not his arrival. The mission was to redeem the creation he loves. You, me, the world. His love was so great that from the beginning of the fall of man, God was working to redeem his creation and in the right real and get in real relationship with them. He was the one that was wronged, and yet he's the one that came to make right and endured the punishment that we deserved and then conquered that through the resurrection. So today, I ask you to sit and reflect. Scripture, it emphasizes God's love and what he accomplished. What is your emphasis? What do you emphasize? Where's your heart? If you're a Christian, maybe you've been emphasizing the wrong thing. You've been saying, we can't take Christ out of Christmas, and yet by your very actions, you've been taking Christ out of Christmas. 
God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Maybe today you're not a Christian and you're, you're, maybe you're just hearing this for the first time because maybe you just stumbled upon this because you're like, what does any of this mean? God loves you. And that's what this all means. It's the whole point of this. We're broken, we're messed up. God provided the rescue plan. Because we weren't meant for a temporal time, we were meant for eternity. And that eternity is to be with him. And so, I ask you today, give your life to Jesus. And maybe you need to repent of something. All you got to do is say, God, I'm sorry. And then you change. Now, is that easy? No, not always. But we align our life with him. We make him the king. We make him the priority, him the focus. Maybe today you've been, again, you've been emphasizing the wrong things. Maybe you are a Christian and you think you've been trying to put Jesus back in Christmas, but really you've been inserting religiosity. I encourage you to repent and also change. Pursue Jesus and make it about why he came. Not just that he came. Because the why is the most significant portion because that's where scripture spends the most time. So may we spend the most time in the right places. I'm going to pray. Lord, I ask that you would help us to have a heart after you, that we would pursue you. That Lord, as we celebrate Christmas, that our eyes would be on what you accomplished and what you wanted to do, which was to seek and to save the lost. So Lord, this Christmas, may the lost be found. May they be redeemed. May that be our heart. May that be our emphasis. And that as we look back at Jesus' arrival, it would cause us to look forward to what you're going to do and that you are coming back again. And so may our lives be aligned with that. We love you, Lord. Give everyone a good rest of their day. And if anyone took offense to what was said today, I ask that you would help them to work through that by your grace and that they would have a heart after you. In your wonderful name, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us for Church Online. If you have any thoughts or questions, because maybe in all of this there you have some, feel free to ask. We will set you up with whatever resources we can so that you will be equipped so that going forward when you have these conversations, you know the, the ins and the outs and the, to the best of your ability and the whys. So God bless. Have a great rest of your day.